Our fellow teacher, Jeffrey Geniak, is back with us today to talk about meditation and self-hypnosis to reduce and eliminate symptoms of childhood trauma. Jeffrey started his journey at an incredibly young age as one of the youngest people ever to be certified as a practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming at the age of 15. He studied psychology at the University of Windsor before becoming a clinical hypnotherapist, a licensed master practitioner of NLP, and a world-renowned expert in brainwave stimulation and entrainment. Welcome back to a Via. Wow, thank you, Andy. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, always great to see you. And I'm I'm so excited about our conversation today. And I'm curious, let's talk, let's start with symptoms because right, what, what we're talking about is helping people reduce symptoms of childhood trauma via various things like meditation and self-hypnosis. What kind of symptoms are, do you see people suffer from who have had childhood trauma? I think one of the clearest and most obvious uh, symptoms that I see and that I notice with people that have had uh, extensive childhood trauma and even, even somewhat minor childhood trauma, I don't know, is there such a thing really? I don't know, I feel silly almost saying that, but you know, as minor is, we see that there's safety and security issues, right? That there's always this, this tendency to view the world as a dangerous place. Not to say that sometimes it isn't, but the studies that have been done on this show very clearly that like if we take a picture, for instance, of, you know, a man working underneath a car and we show it to somebody that has had childhood trauma and we show it to somebody that hasn't, the person with childhood trauma has a tendency to build a story around that picture that involves like something like the, the, uh, the, the axle or something falling off or the, or the, the lift falling down and the car crushing the man fixing the car or, you know, there's a tendency to build a picture and a storyline of danger, of negative outcomes. And, and that's probably the one of the biggest symptoms we see because that impacts every area of a person's life. We know that when people start to project negative outcomes in their life, it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And as a person ages and a person continues to view the world like that and to always see and expect negative outcomes, they do, as we know, tend to manifest more often. And then it just, it just builds and builds and builds in a person's life. And that for me, whenever I'm dealing with somebody or treating somebody with extensive childhood trauma, that we, one of the things I first I really work on is helping them build better stories in terms of how they see the world and also their future. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, absolutely. So thank you. I appreciate you going into that. And, and the safety um, conversation is, I think, so important. And I'm glad that you brought that up because that I think is sometimes right, like just the underlying uh, struggle that so many people have, obviously it would make sense. Why? Because if they had un unsafe childhood and lots of bad things happened, then uh, of course, yes, the tendency would be to project that out into their adult life. Um, so let's talk, I'd like to break down meditation as well as self-hypnosis. -hypno so let's start with meditation. So First off, what kind of meditation are we talking about and, and how can it help people reduce and or eliminate these symptoms? Well, one of the things I love about meditation is that it's all about, well, depending on the kind of meditation, there's all kinds, but generally speaking, meditation helps to build that space of peace and calm. And one of the things that we know about the brain is that the more that we experience anything, the more easy it is to experience it. So the more that we're happy, the easier it is for us to maintain and sustain happiness. The more that we visit a place of calm and peace, the easier it is for us to invoke it, to call it in and to be there and to actually get it, get it to the point in our lives where we can just will it, <laughs> you know, just easily enter that peace or that space of peace and calm. And so that aspect of meditation is really important for people that are struggling with safety and security in their life, because what they can do with just a very minimal amount of training and education is that they can practice countering that sense of I'm not safe, I'm not secure, I feel threatened with going into that space of peace and calm once they know how. And 
once people do it again and again and again, it can become automatic. And there's a story I used to tell, and I, I do occasionally here, I'll tell it here today, that I used to work in the gaming industry as a, a, a casino dealer, believe it or not. I was putting myself through university and I got to tell you, it was an exciting job for a little while, but then it was just the most horrifying thing ever when my consciousness kicked in and perceived all the pain and suffering that was around. And by two o'clock every day, the stress was so high in my body that I literally, I, I, I think I lost 20 IQ points by two o'clock, right? It was just, and that's, what's, that's the price of stress. And after I quit and I left and I decided to pursue really my soul's journey, I, I describe it as, uh, one of the things that I had to deal with is that at two o'clock every day, I seem to just get dumb. <laughs> and like that whole experience. And it's because for 13 years, I mean, that's how long I was there. That was my habitual pattern that I would just get in. And my brain literally automated that whole process as a survival mechanism. And so what we do, and this is true, and I had to go through this whole process of breaking it. And anything that we do again and again and again can become automated. And so with a little bit of training, we teach some really basic meditation practices to people and they're able to just, uh, as soon as they feel that, that tension rise up, they take that breath, they take that whatever step it is, whatever type of meditation that works for them. And then that becomes automatic. And pretty soon, people can train themselves that as soon as a certain amount of tension comes up, it's followed right up by a sense of peace and calm. Now, what type of meditation are we talking about? Well, this is something that is very important to consider. Not every type of meditation is well suited for every type of individual. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's roughly eight, nine types of meditation that all really do lead to the same source. Now, we're, we often hear the research on mindfulness, which is the gold standard, right, of, of meditation in terms of the research and the effectiveness. However, it is also one of the most difficult to sustain and maintain as a, as a practice. It's very difficult. And, and people start to practice this type of meditation, mindfulness, and they give up because they can't figure out how to get some cons consistent results with it. But there's all types of meditations that people can start with. People that are visual type of learners, for instance, we can introduce a visual type of meditation and it's easy for them to have success with it. Other people are have fine ears, you, you, your, your musicians, for instance, then you can, for those people, you can bring in an auditory type of mantra meditation and it gets them to the same place. And because we're really only looking to get them to that space of peace and calm. And so we can use any of these meditations. It doesn't have to be mindfulness. And so what I find key in my practice is understanding the individual and what, where their strengths are. What, what are their learning habits? What do they really enjoy? And as soon as I find that out, I can pair the right type of meditation for them and get them you know, get that practice started for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I love that you stress that, right? Basically not, there's no one size fits all and, and we are all individuals and there's, there's options because I think that's, that's so key for people. And one, one thing I'm curious about, you mentioned uh, a bit ago about the price of stress. And I want to kind of like touch on that again. And we were kind of talking about this a little bit before we hopped on today, right? Like how much stress, obviously childhood trauma being a massive form of stress can impact our physical well-beings. Like how are you seeing that show up for people? 